Hello and you're very welcome to The Big Tech Show with me, Adrian Weckler, the tech editor of The Irish and Sunday Independent. And this week's episode is brought to you by PwC. Now, over the last few days, we were at the Web Summit in Lisbon and we met lots of interesting people, including our guest this week, Des Trainer, the co-founder of Intercom, a 1 billion euro homegrown software company. And we talked about things like what happens when you become very successful, whether your company culture changes and lots of other things besides. This is how the conversation went. Uh, Des, thanks for, for chatting today. A um, couple of things I want to talk about. Um, AI chatbots. Mm -hmm. which Intercom recently uh, introduced. Give me an idea of what that's about and why you kind of introduced it as a feature. So the logic behind any application of AI uh, is usually to sort of uh, run calculations at a speed that can't be run uh, by humans in a sense, yeah. at a scale that can't be achieved by humans as well. Uh, and occasionally you then have like some sort of obscure pattern recognition and like so where you're literally perceiving things at a, mm -hmm. at a scale that isn't possible for any human to comprehend but it is possible for like terabytes of RAM and, and like you know several several million processors to mm -hmm. pair up and work through. What we wanted to do with AnswerBot was let businesses uh, operate at a scale beyond what their current human capacity would let them by targeting the like the what we would consider to be like the like most high frequency, uh, low nuance, low value conversations, uh, and deliver instant answers to them. So when I say like uh, high frequency, I mean you're getting a lot of them, and they're not particularly nuanced. So mm. if you take an average piece of software, like how do I reset my password, or where do I sign up for your newsletter? Mm. These are all questions that like there's not they're not really beautiful opportunities to carve a new customer relationship out. Mm. What they really are is somebody asking a very direct question, wanting a very specific answer, mm. and wanting it Im immediately and and you can't staff to scale. You can't scale your staff to like deliver that quality of service immediately, always, nor accuracy for that matter. Because obviously you have to train them all. And then if, if you if your newsletter changes or whatever, that whole uh, the answer changes. You need that to play out across the social graph of knowledge. Uh, however, what Answerbot is is basically a way to say when a conversation looks like it's going this direction, offer this information. And for like we have like thirty thousand customers, and for a, a good chunk of them, they have a lot of answers that are. Uh, that, that fall into that category. So what we really wanted to do was just deliver a great, uh, a, a great opportunity to our customers to like let their teams focus on the high value conversations and let the sort of easy things take care of themselves. One of the things about with that I read, I think it, may, it might have been your statistic or maybe it was somebody else, that there was a, roughly a 29% mm -hmm. or so uh, rate of success yes. with customers finding uh, a resolution. Is there any chance that some of them might just have given up when they got to a, a chatbot situation that I find that myself with like Aer Lingus for example Aer Lingus's website is I don't mind saying it's fairly dreadful in terms of when I want to find an answer to yeah. a problem I'm having there I just I most of the time I give up so there's a few things going on there like it's it's you can't tell if somebody has fundamentally given up because what I actually registers like is just no net new behavior which occasionally could look exactly like what happens when you get the right answer. Like, so, you know, are you open tonight? No, we're not open tonight. Close tab. Uh, versus, uh, and that closed tab could well be exactly what they wanted to do because they got the answer they wanted. So you can't actually, like, distinguish these things purely. The, the positive signs we'd say that would suggest that that's not the majority of the cases is a lot of the time people will click all, they, they will choose to self-resolve. Self so they'll say, yes, this totally answered my question. Uh, the fact that you're actually having a conversation in the messenger means that they don't, like, it's not like a, a you know, when they ask the question, it's not clear they're talking to a chatbot, and the chatbot only answerbot specifically only intervenes when it when it thinks it has a high degree of confidence that it can add value to the conversation. So, from a customer's point of view, uh, their options are like they might say something like, "Hey, uh, where do I cancel my account or how do I get a refund?" Uh, and what they'll see is you can get refunds here. Here's the link, and then your options are like that answered my question or I want to talk to the team. And if they click, I want to talk to the team, it gets rooted straight to the customer support team, or or if it's a sales inquiry to sales team. And we, we, we sort of like, we look at the activity across all of those options. And, you know, we'd say for sure, like we don't think what's happening is people are quitting out because we see too much positive, uh, as I said, self-closing and too many other people deliberately saying, no, I want to go talk to the team. So, yeah. I, I saw one other statistic from Gartner. <coughs> It's really typical, you know, whenever you're kind of reaching for something, you always quote something from Gartner, right? <laughs> but it, I think they said it was 85% they thought of customer interactions by 2020 or something would yeah. be 
um, chatbots. I'm not sure how old that figure. That might be like two years old yeah. though, because chatbots were a big deal. Yeah, two, they were three hyped years very ago. badly a few years ago. Like they were overhyped and then underdelivered in the space of like six months. So it was classic. Yeah, I remember. Hype it. I was stuff. kind of part of that mania as well. Yeah. I, was, I, I remember going to a Microsoft conference, a build Microsoft build conference, yeah. and that's all they wanted to talk about was yeah. chatbots. And I came back thinking, you know, hey, hey everybody, in 12 months' time. You yeah. know, your hotel's going to talk to your airline so and you want to do anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And it didn't really um, come to pass like that. Is it just that it's slower rolling out or or what? Why didn't it happen? I, I think the... Well, my personal take is that the solution is it looks like... It, I often say, like, you think of AI as augmented intelligence, not as artificial intelligence. Think of it as a blend. Like, think of it as basically being a second brain that can do all these, like high computational, like sort of long-term memory, a quick analysis type stuff. I think to make it work, you need to, you need to offer the customer certainty that it'll work, right? So, and the, the way Intercom offers that certainty is we're saying, this is a team supported by AI. This is not AI instead of a team. And I think that's what makes people actually choose to engage. Whereas if like, if in the Aer Lingus case or whatever, if there was like a button saying like, um, talk to our chatbot, no one would click it. Mm-hmm. If there's a thing saying talk to us, people will click it. The, the piece that I think we got wrong or like technology industry got wrong in two or so years ago when it was like, you know, as you said, Microsoft, uh, Facebook had a big uh, sort of proclamation that bots were the future, is that um, they, they did the classic technology thing of taking a really specific narrow slice of things uh, that uh, any given function does, where it's customer support or whatever, automating it and then sort of saying job done, right? And that's the most common sort of pattern we see in the tech industry is like we take a real narrow slice of human behavior, fix it, and then say that we've replicated humans or something, right? Right. In this case, I think what you need is an ability to catch nuance. And that's what we've built with our sort of failover with the sort of idea of saying, well, no, the team is here too, but the bots working alongside them. That works. Um, the alternative is saying everything's going to be bot first and bot only. That will basically set people up for disappointment, which kind of caused the bot backlash of, of a sort. Did you see Google's demo? What was it six, eight months ago yeah, where yeah. They, they launched it uh, on stage? Yeah. And it seemed to work uh, yeah. live on stage. And one was a hair appointment. The other one was, I think, booking a table at a restaurant. Mm-hmm. And what took everybody's breath away, kind of, was how realistic the bot sounded the inflections in the voices, the nuance, as you say, mm-hmm. the up speaking even, yeah, sure, yeah, we yeah. can book that for yeah. you on Tuesday at eight, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Um, is that where we're going? Are we there yet with that kind of natural language or was that, do you think, just a glimpse of what we might have? Are you talking specifically about the voice? The voice and what the voice means for your understanding of the level of intelligence of the bot you're dealing with. Right. Like the, the voice yeah. is really just a symptom to suggest to you as a customer on the other end of the line yeah. that somebody is having something meaningful with you yeah, yeah. Um, as opposed to you know, just an accent for an accent's sake. Um, is that a false flag? Because my reaction to it was both impressed and slightly cynical at the same yeah. time because why do you need to, to put well, those inflections yeah, on human it, voice? You should, you're correct. Like, it's both impressive and you can be skeptical of its motivation. In general, like the way you make uh, yourself attractive to somebody else is you mimic their behavior and that's what kind of creates a parody of behavior which is like the same way as like, you know, if someone brushes their hair and the other person brushes their hair at the same time it's usually a sign of flirting or whatever. Right? Like that's, that's how humans basically respond positively to other people. So when somebody speaks like a human in the sort of same, in this case, Californian uptick drawl uh, that, like, that the order is being made in, people respond well to it. So they're like, oh, you're a human too, that's great. Uh, the skepticism is correct in that, in that like, there's somebody, who, like, <coughs> probably inside Google, who's spending a lot of time doing a lot of, like, they're doing like, effectively two different things. They're like, working on voice intonations and how, like, do, how, to, how to mimic things like vocal fry and, up, and uptick and all that sort of stuff so that they can sound like humans, even though those things are actually themselves imperfections so like they're not even like you know they're, they're working on copying the mistakes uh, which is fine uh, because they, their goal is to kind of create that sort of bond with the other human the other side of it is like more how do we make sure that like you know your, your appointment is book, your booking is complete sure I've got it or yeah cool we'll see you tomorrow they're all like, they're all you could consider them all like random walks through a certain path of how to say we did the thing we wanted to do in the, in like the, in the 70s, that would have come out on the punch code as being a one in the, in the booking complete uh, section. Yeah. In the 80s, it would have been operation completed or whatever. Uh, we're getting really advanced. There where now we can vary our language and tone. 
Um, so is that somewhat analogous then to just picking a different color for a phone or a car or clothes or something in that they do the same thing. The basic thing is to clothe you, to get you somewhere, to let you communicate with something. But, you know, some, one is a nicer color, one is a, a more pleasing surface. Is that the same with language uh, and the communication tone? Uh, that it's just a device that we know it's dev a device that doesn't actually uh, 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 make for more efficiency, but it's just more pleasing because we're human? More, well, so it, there's a few different things going on there. Like One reason you'd do it is because it makes people believe that there's a human on the other side or it makes them feel more comfortable uh, talking to it. Yeah. The second one is like if, the, if you are like that salon, you probably have an opinion on how you should sound and you probably, you probably don't want someone to sound like The Rock being like, yo, we got your book and that would, that would be set the wrong brand. I so. don't know. I think there well, could be a menu of yeah. voices. You know, you yeah, go, yeah, for sure. Oh, we totally got your... And indeed, if you, if, if you remember the 80s, like, uh, you could buy cassettes of like various answering machine things yeah. uh, where you could play like, hey, this is a celebrity here or whatever. Like, it's basically, it's a form of expression for the business. In the same yeah. way, like styling your intercom messenger to like, be, like, have certain colors, certain patterns, certain textures, and all your staff have certain photo filters, whatever. People do all that too. It's like business like to express their, their brand in any way they can. Right. Um, in this case, like, I think like, you know, there's, there's two tiers. There's like, one, sound like a human so that people don't get freaked out. Yeah. And then two, sound like our business. And that's, like, that's yeah. what they're going for there. It's a, it's a, I would say it's a, it's a massive engineering challenge for what is actually a relatively iceberg like uh, in that it's pretty small what you see on the on the on the north side of it like do you, do you buy that technology off the shelf and work around it or is there anything within that that you build yourself the intent stuff not a lot uh, so so the, the intent my uh, sorry uptick and all that sort of stuff um for us, if you're asking me to answer about specifically, we've built it all ourselves. There's a lot of on-the-shelf stuff there. Google have a product called Dialogflow, IBM of uh, Watson, uh, Salesforce of Einstein, although I don't think Einstein would actually do what we do. Um, and, you know, you could, there's, there's, a, there's generalized uh, AI problems, like work out what this thing is about, i.e., like, it, and what that usually does is, like, strips out all the common words. So if I say to you, hey, did you see that Andre vs. Bose is here? Uh, it'll just say Andre vs. Boas and, and, yeah. the, and it strips out all the other junk and then, it, and then it looks at ordering of the words and all that sort of stuff. All that is on the shelf. The stuff uh, that we have to look, look at specifically is we know uh, both what are the most common questions SaaS customers are likely to ask. Then also we know for any given business they have certain key areas that they get grilled on most. And then we also know that historically your support team have been giving answers that look like this. So we can generally suggest to a new customer Here's a really common question you get, and here's your most successful answers that you've ever given to that question. Mm -hmm. We suggest you add this to AnswerBot, and he or she, depending on how you want to think about AnswerBot, or they, will, uh, will start spitting out those answers for you from here onwards. That's how we do it. Uh, and I think when we looked at the off-the-shelf options, it would have been at least as much work, plus obviously new expense and new complexities and all that sort of stuff to bring on, to like, take on somebody else's solution. So we built our own. Um, what, what, how's Intercom going? Uh, the last time we spoke, I think it was uh, January or February. January, yeah. And since then, you uh, had a few big announcements. You disclosed a little bit, disclosed a little bit more about your financials or yeah. the basic economic infrastructure of the company. It's a unicorn now mm -hmm. uh, by valuation anyway. Uh, oh, what does that feel like, by the way, being a unicorn? Uh, it doesn't really feel different at all. Uh, but like only because... We've never really been too like, you know, I guess like the valuation is the, the best thing you have as a kind of shared agreement with other people that the company is like, is, is at a certain point. Right. Um, so it definitely like, it helps check a few boxes for a few folks like yourselves or whatever, right. who like if I well, tell you. Exactly like you know, yourself, because so, every single yeah. article I see yeah. now written about Intercom, particularly in the US mm -hmm. press, um, it's unicorn, blah, 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 Intercom. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like, it's like we just met a startup there a couple of seconds ago called Grandpal, right? Yeah. If I told you, like, now, hey, the Grandpal did a Series B at 20 million from Kleiner, you're like, fuck, I want to talk to Grandpal, I right? Know. Like, you know, and like, I that's know, it's a validation. That, We're all playing yeah. the same validation game. I understand. So, like, so that's probably the biggest sort of uh, step change, I, I think, is that, like, you're one degree more valid. Like, I'm no longer grateful to a journalist for being like, oh, well, you're going right. to, you know, you know um, but like, you know, personally, it doesn't feel any different. The day, you know, inside the company, it didn't feel any different. Like, we've always been in the same game of build great software and sell it. Like, it's, mm -hmm. it's not, it's, right. you know, the, the value is, is kind of like a, a, a different, like sort of maybe like uh, indicator. You could argue that it's lagging or leading, depending on how you think about your, your sort of life. Um, you've, yeah. you've been, for the last couple of years in general, you've been hiring quite a lot. I mean, yes. how, how many people do you have now in the company? So we like doubled our product team in the last, I guess, year or so. I think we were at 270 or something like that. In Dublin, right. we're like 600 worldwide. Right. Um, yeah, we, you know, like, it's, it's, yeah, we've been always like, 
if you say like, you know, in any other industry going from like four people to over 600 in seven years is like pretty big. In software, like that's grand, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. it's funny because yeah. I remember talking to Owen maybe three or four years ago, I think three yeah. years ago, and pretty much the company is on almost exactly the trajectory that he said yeah. he thought it would be in three years' time. That's kind of rare. Usually it's, you know, a little bit flatter yeah, yeah. or maybe one in a thousand is much, much yeah, higher. Yeah, yeah. But Intercom is yeah. pretty much going on, on a fairly even sort of 35 degree, 45 degree. Is that right? Have I got my angle right? 45 degree, roughly. That's uh, I, I don't know what either my, scale. I don't know yeah. what either uh, either scale represents, but I'll just so I can't really confirm forty five. But like, what are the issues uh, that come with that? Not issues, oh, yeah. but are there new things that come with the, managing a company? Yeah, that like size? just I, I, as we've gone, you were talking about people specifically. Yeah, like, um, yeah, like Jesus. Yeah, uh, it's you go from like a team where we started to like teams. Uh, like so now it's like the product team and the sales team and the marketing team, and they don't necessarily get along. And that's like teams of teams, so it's like we're not. It's not even the marketing team we don't like. It's the comms team or whatever. Oh, right? Like you, know, <laughs> uh, and uh, and then you have teams of teams of teams. And like now we're at a point now we're like, like so in intercom every year like you uh, we get you a graffiti artist does like a comic of you and uh, uh, for every year you cross. And I'm now seeing like people who I have yet to meet celebrate the one year anniversary of somebody else who I've yet to meet in the company. And I'm like, well, that's weird, you know. Maybe I should travel to like Chicago more or whatever, but like you know, uh, like we have five offices now, so like it, there's a whole heap of new complexity and new distances, and then as a result, kind of new processes you have to form, and there's a real tension you find of like this. There's a dynamic of like of like you have to bring in process, but like you have to do it so begrudgingly because otherwise you, it's it's exactly what slows you down, but it's also exactly what makes you predictable and maybe a bit more standard, mm. and uh, and a lot of folks kind of like especially if you're joined us uh, in the very early days it feels like the company's changing and I'm kind of like F yeah it is like that's the point like you know we, right. we're not like you know we're not like seven like people in a, in a small room anymore yeah um, but all change is uncomfortable and, uh, and some people are like you know they're I, I've sort of with the benefit of like the few years I've had I've never realized when people say like oh I'm a kind of an early stage company guy or girl I'm like, yeah, I, I get what that means. Like, they, they have a certain size at which they like to dip their toes in like a lot of different jobs. They like to work across things. They like, they like to know everyone in the company, and it's just not going to happen at a certain point. So you kind of you have to like go through these sort of uh, changes. And the other piece I see a lot is um, you hear companies saying we have to preserve our culture. We have to preserve our culture, mm -hmm. and I, I think that's that's totally the wrong way of framing. It. I think it's like we have to evolve our culture. Uh, and you, you preserve things by putting them in a museum and making them a relic, right? Like uh, you evolve things if you want them to stay alive. Now you have to deliberately evolve them, and you have to never give ground you don't want to give. And, and like you have to be really, really careful about that, like militantly careful about it. What does that mean in practice? What that means is like uh, somebody tries to bring in a new cultural element uh, that you don't like. It means you have to stop it immediately. Um, if somebody. Uh, similarly, how, how do you mean though? I, I'm trying to think like, of an example. So, uh, let's say you might hire somebody who's in the last company they worked in was a pretty aggressive attitude, and it was like mm. it was all, you know, like all like you know, let's say very like very uh, typically uh, aggressive, maybe like overly unnecessarily masculine or whatever. Hard it was edged, like, right. Quite like a very a very competitive driven, very like maybe very like uh, high level sports oriented or whatever. Yeah. And if, if they wanted to kind of standardize that as being a, a type of culture that you that is now going to become acceptable behavior. You have to be like, yo, that's not how we behave. Even at if all. they get results, even if they're well, this is the challenge. This yeah. is the choice. Yeah, like so. So yeah. somebody comes in with that yeah. uh, attitude or with that yeah. culture. Yeah, they're a high achiever. They get lots done. Are they are they derailing what it is that you want to do? Like, uh, and and like, are you measuring their results in the short term, but their cultural damage in the in, in the long term? If you know what I mean, like you have to like think about the the ways. Like the the general question you ask yourself there is for any given behavior or individual, you sort of say like, yo. Does it, you know, what's its impact? Is it good or bad? And uh, what's its behavior? Like, is it something we want, we want more of or something we want less of? And uh, and then you have to ask questions like, what's the worst behavior we'll tolerate for a high-performing person? What's the worst uh, impact we'll tolerate from a really, really well-behaving uh, person, say, right? You, Do you, you feel grateful might be the wrong word, but there have been a couple of companies that have come before you, companies like HubSpot and other companies like that, that have... Um, found themselves in the news. I think it was the Dan Lines wrote a book about HubSpot having mm -hmm. gone to work there, and a lot of the issues that he talked about, a lot of what got picked up most yeah. was that kind of stuff. It, most of it wasn't egregious, but it was just sim symbolic of 
particularly masculine kind of aggressive thing. But that is out there. That has is a well-worn narrative. Maybe something that you have seen and you're forewarned about it. Is that would would has that played any part in forewarning you about that, or is it very much learning as you go? I think. Uh, I don't mean that specific incident. I just yeah, mean no, no, for sure. examples uh, like that. Like broadly, what I'd say is. Um, the world has gotten a lot more interested in the ins and outs of software as a service tech businesses. And that means you can like now write, like you can now do a year working in one and simply write what you've found or what you believe, want to claim to have found. And, uh, and somehow that will sell copies. Whereas like genuinely, like in, I'm sure you realize it's like 10 years ago, no one would have given a shit. Yeah. You know, oh, wow, there's a weird company doing some weird things. Mm. <laughs> anyway, like... Uh, so I think the, the only element of forewarning I have is I, I, I would sort of take from any of any of this is just that like you know like people are going to notice all this sort of stuff and you have to like be careful about what and be be careful to be proud of what you. What I mean, they, you they really do, and like there's an ongoing narrative with some of the biggest tech companies with issues of toxicity, masculinity. Um, and I do sometimes wonder, we, we spoke a little bit about this mm-hmm. before in our last podcast, and you had some kind of very reasonable views. Actually, things you, you said made me go back and think again about, about the issues. But I do wonder as well whether it's necessarily, it, whether it's more endemic in those companies' industry than it is in other industries, and whether it is that we are more focused on those because they're more, you know, they're more public companies they appear to represent a certain thing like the Google walkout for example mm-hmm. last week is a good example in Dublin hundreds of people walked out of uh, Google's headquarters in, in a very amicable way it has yeah. to be said with by and large the um, acquiescence of the managers there yeah. didn't seem to be any bad blowback yeah. over it um, but I'm just wondering is it worse in this industry do we imagine that it's worse in tech because we, we talk about tech and problem with uh, gender balance uh, all the time. Is it worse there than other industries or are we just more focused on it? We're just more aware of it. I think, I, I don't know because I mean, I, yeah. I've only had like... The only reason I'm asking you, you're kind of no, a no. wide thinker. I feel comfortable yeah, asking you these yeah, questions. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, it's, a, it's a fair question. I'd say like I've only had like three jobs in my life, give or take, so I don't really have a great broad perspective here. What, was um, the, what were the last two? Uh, well, it depends on how you count my jobs. But like, uh, so I worked as a lecturer in Minute. Yeah. I worked as a consultant for a company called IQ Content. Oh yeah. And then I worked uh, with Own on Contrast and then okay. Exceptional and then Intercom. No politics in uh, academia, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> cer- cer- certainly not. Uh, no, no it was, times were different then, I'd say. Uh, yeah. But um, the the broader answer I'd say is, I think. If you take something like maybe the finance industry, like the mm. classic Wall Street finance industry, I don't know if they'd care if the te- if the like the press was to just slate all mm. their behavior. I don't know. I, I know for sure they're a bit more secret uh, in mm. general. Like the, it's you know like they're basically like they're not they're not out there like telling you all how they're going to change the world and all that. Like they're not you know yeah. they're not. I think maybe it's possible the tech puts itself up on a little bit of a pedestal to be uh, sort of yep. have stones thrown at it. Um, yep. I think that's possibly a challenge for it. Mm. I you know. I, I would love somebody to do the studies and, t- and, and work out how much worse is tech than the average industry in a sense. Yeah. Um, but I mean, but, you but, must but see that in, yeah. in Intercom as well because yeah. like when I've spoken to Owen or you before, uh, or you yeah. before yeah. there is definitely a tone in talking to you that you, you, you do want to do the right thing, that you are yeah. ethical, that you, yeah. you look for moral ways to do things, even the way you're talking now uh, yeah. about culture. And does that, you know, so is that a disadvantage if and when something happens, not an intercom, but in, in the industry, are you judged by a harsher stick then? I don't know, and I don't mind if we are. Uh, honestly, because like, in, I think we hold ourselves to a very, a, we judge ourselves with a very harsh stick um, ourselves. Uh, I'm, we're, like, I'm personally like happy to be held to a high standard. I hope, I hope every industry should be, and I would want to be. Uh, but it's certainly like I wouldn't, like if something happens that. I'm not proud of an intercom. I would not excuse it by saying, well, look at this other industry if you think we're bad. Like, I think that's relevant context for when you're writing a kind of a, a scathing thing on why the whole tech industry is bad. Yeah. But for me personally, I still want to like run the best company that I can uh, in the best way as I can. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, there is also maybe another edge to it uh, in our industry, in the media industry. I've spoken about this before. Sometimes I do feel that we 
put the boot in just an extra 10% or 20% into the biggest tech companies, the web yeah. tech companies, yeah. for maybe commercial reasons, not consciously for commercial reasons, but just because we're still all pissed off that Google and Facebook stole our ads, yeah, and yeah. therefore anything that puts the boot into them deserves you know, page three rather than page 11. I don't mean in a newspaper, I just mean yeah. using that as a metaphor. Yeah. Um, Are you saying we should cancel our newsfeed feature? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. It's we quality, don't trusted, verified news, yeah. I'll tell you that, for nothing. Yeah. Actually, I actually do believe that. I do believe there will be newspapers in a while. Paul Dacre, the editor of the Daily Mail, uh, former editor, not necessarily especially mm-hmm. you know, uh, notably enlightened person, um, but very successful. He believes there'll be newspapers around in, in um, five or ten years, and actually I do too as well. Yeah. Um, I think like the, there's a great article by uh, Clay Christensen and a few others called Breaking News. And if, if, if you haven't read it, I really suggest it. I think it's a brilliant article. Mm. It talks a lot about like, you know, this idea of jobs to be done that we've talked about a lot mm. in Intercom, this idea of like, understanding core motivation. But one of the pieces it draws on is this idea of like, the core uh, piece of news that is super valuable is what he calls, I think it's, like, it's PICA, Perspective Insight Commentary and Analysis. And he's like, that's the piece that you actually have to employ somebody to deliver. Mm. It's like you can't generate it, you can't automate it, and you can't get it in the 140 characters. Mm. It's basically like, here's the thing that's happened, and here's like why it's happened, and here's, here's the landscape that's happened, and all that sort of stuff. And I think like that job will live on for 100 years, and it'll always involve humans, or at least, I, 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 it's, it's really stretching into AI to actually be able to like, to like, say like what you might do if you're talking about Facebook, you might like have to localize it to specifically what it means in the Irish media industry, along with what it means for the fact that Facebook has an office in Dublin and all right. that sort of stuff. Like it's, it's that, that's not gonna get generated and I think it's always gonna be valuable. So like I, I, yeah. I, I think what'll happen is, uh, I think the, the overall pie might end up shrinking a little bit for sure, as it already has. Uh, but I just think it just needs a bit more like, sort of um, you know, precise resolution on, on exactly what it's trying to do. Yeah. And I think like the wrong thing for everyone to do is try and take on BuzzFeed or whatever. You know, it's just, it's just a different game. I know. And we're, they're really good at their game. Like, Yeah, a lot of us in the Irish media are trying to figure out what we're going to do next on the digital front. I know the Sunday Business Post is looking for... Yeah. I don't know how we got into the Sunday Business Post. Sunday Business Post is looking for an editor at the moment, and I'm pretty sure that their direction wants now to be... Uh, to do what they do, but also to try and develop into um, a more compelling uh, business model. We're, we're the same. We're yeah. our business model is continually um, evolving. Um, but uh, I'm not sure how we got onto that. It is quite, quite interesting. Like, just come back to Intercom for sure. a second. What sure. do you think is next for Intercom? The last time we spoke, obviously you would have been working on the the AI chatbot stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything similar you're working on? Is there any, do you have projects on the go all the time? Or so what's going on? Uh, we're like a few weeks out from like doing our big roadmap planning for like for 2019, but I can tell you that the core ingredients like for Intercom for the last year or two and what will definitely be the, the area going forward is the technological bets we make are like one is our messenger and we released a substantial re- re-release of our messenger in April, Messenger 4, uh, which was a platform that other, other people can then build products that sit inside our messenger and so it's now like you know, we have like a hundred different uh, software companies b- building uh, like their solution to deliver inside our messenger, which is incredible. Um, then we also took a big bet on automation, and in that world, we delivered first of all these like custom bots, so you can have like things like the refund bot or the t-shirt bot or whatever. And like that's kind of a, a sort of a specific walk down and navigated s- uh, series of like questions. So like, what t-shirt size are you? Blah blah blah, and it gets you to a desired outcome for the business and for the end user. And then most recently, answer bot. Uh, which was, uh, we, as we just talked about, the AI sort of uh, piece. Uh, I think messengers, bots, uh, automation is like the, the big sort of technological landscape we play in. Our mission has always been making internet business personal, and we try to do that by kind of controlling and, and, and making as qual- high quality as possible every conversation between every internet business and every customer. Our key areas that we play in is like sales support and uh, marketing. and. So anything we do is going to be in the area of applying bots, messengers, uh, and, and apps on and a platform to sales support and marketing with a view towards making businesses more successful. Here at the Web Summit, there's a couple of actual robots. It's actually the same old mm-hmm. tired ones that we've seen the last few years, Sophia the robot and a, and a few others. And they're basically just mannequin heads that yeah, yeah. sit there. And some of them have better facial expressions now than they did last year or the year before. Can you see a time when something like Intercom's uh, platform or services get close to physical robots? I don't know. Uh, like, I wouldn't say not in the short, 
not in a short time horizon, maybe not even in a medium time horizon. The piece like we need to work out is like our, our the area we play in is like internet businesses. So it's businesses that do the predominant amount of their work through the actual internet. So like, but like you, you can take a broad view on that. Like Domino sells a lot of pizzas through the internet, you know. So that you can call them an internet company. Uh, we're like, did, what does a robot do distinctly differently? Well, it's a physical thing that's going to be in a store with you. Uh, we're like, we're quite a long way away from actually wanting to to own that. Like, uh, those robots are an alternative to actual in-person human conversation, right? Well, self-driving cars are robots in in, mm -hmm. in a sense, in that it's yeah. Like another example might be like say in, in San Francisco right now, this thing called Cafe X, which is a, a barista robot basically, and it sits on a corner. I don't know if it has a gender, but like it sits on a corner mm -hmm. uh, making lattes for people, and you swipe your card and you say latte. Have you seen it? You've probably seen it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, and it waves at you when your coffee's ready. And uh, and well, like, what's the difference between that and a vending machine? Like just fancier, uh, yeah, better uh, coffee, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and, and like there's like there's a spectrum of questions there. And what's the difference between that and right. a barista? Right, yeah. right. Like uh, uh, you know, yeah. this is this is like the spectrum of the human condition in a sense, right? Like uh, and like when vending machines came out, people talked about how inhumane they were as well. Mm -hmm. Like you know, and how they're going to take our jobs. So like it's you know, yeah. It, all of these things will come around. Last bit about um, San Francisco. We were talking before the podcast about Propsy, and that's, which is a homeless thing in San Francisco. And you know, the tech community is kind of divided. Maybe not that divided, but one or two of them, have Mark, Mark Benioff of Salesforce, has gone out on a limp to uh, promote it. By the time this podcast comes out, we'll know because yeah. um, the, the vote is today. Do you think the political climate in, in San Francisco with technology companies, it, is it kind of ramping up? Because Obviously, Intercom has a big base now in San Francisco. Is it ramping up? Is it is it heightened now at the moment? Is it more intense than it was? I get the feeling that it's more political now with tech companies. Is it just because they're bigger, or I actually don't know. Okay. Uh, I, so I haven't like because I had a daughter uh, recently. I haven't been in San Francisco a lot oh, of this congratulations. year. Congratulations! Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I don't really know. Like, uh, and it's hard. Like, it's a hard. I don't know what my barometer for your question would be in a sense. Like, are people reading a lot more news or like? For sure, like obviously, with the presidential election two years ago, people have been talking a lot more about politics than they probably were for the eight years before. Um, so I think like people are definitely paying a lot more attention. Well, but, so yeah. like two years ago, there were protests against Google buses going from San right. Francisco down the 101 yeah. down yes. to San Jose. And that was sort of sort of activism. Mm -hmm. um, but now in 2018 the tech companies themselves are getting embroiled in political issues like this uh, Prop C, for example. Yeah, it's becoming I, more it, direct. So, um, I mean, we could just talk about Prop C straight for a second. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, is it a political issue? I mean, like, I, like, what I'd say about a tech company getting involved in Prop C is basically, because uh, they're based in SF, is basically a, a, a company having an opinion on an tax that would directly affect it. Right. Now, I think that type of behavior happens all over the world. Like, yeah, you know, I'm absolutely. sure if there was a newspaper tax, your folks would have something to say about it too, right? Uh, no, not us. <laughs> um, so, like, you know, when you break these things down, they're relatively simple issues. I think what yeah. catches people off guard maybe is, like, is uh, that, that, that the kind of the reality, the kind of reminder of, hey, like, this is actually a, an incorporated business mm. uh, that's now being asked to pay a new tax that it hadn't forecasted, and now it needs to think about it, you know, right. and, and for sure... If you ask a lot of businesses, are you, are you down for paying another tax? Mm -hmm. The answer rarely is like, hell yeah, you know. So like, mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't surprise me that people have taken the stance against it. I mean, but on the on the counterpoint, like, uh, I, I think ultimately Prop C comes down to it. Like, you can almost describe it as two different approaches to project management. One of them is like, let's get the resources in place first, i.e. the money, mm -hmm. and then we'll work out how we'll solve the problem. And another one is, let's work out what the problem is what we need to solve it, and then we'll work out how much money we need, and then we can work out what tax we'll collect. Yeah, so the first would be Benioff, Salesforce, which is, and which is the Prop C proposition, yep. which is just get more tax in, and then we'll figure out how to spend money. Yep. And then the second one is the mayor's approach, which is supported by probably more tech companies, or probably the majority of tech companies, certainly Stripe, because they, they've come out publicly to, to support, and Jack Dorsey, actually, mm -hmm. uh, with Twitter, which is to say, let's figure out a plan, and then maybe we can talk about... Let's work out what we're trying to do, and then and, and we'll work out how much money we need to do it. The, the, obviously, I, mean, I know you're aware of like the, the peculiarity with Square and Stripe is obviously they're both extra affected by it because they're like high revenue, low margin businesses, right. and the taxes on revenue, not on profit right. or anything else. So like it's a, it's they stand to be hurt worse than most, which is yep. why I think they. So for a company that's focusing on growth more than profit, uh, it's, it's it's not even that though. It's it's specific to like a, a, like if you. Think of like say, let's say you're a payments business. So, you, so for every hundred dollars of revenue you bring in, uh, 
you might only get to keep let's say like x percent because you have to pay off your your like your visas your mastercards right. or whoever uh yeah so your, your margins are thinner by definition because you sit in this sort of stack of, of, of so it's of disproportionately things. yeah so, so like so you up. you have to bring in a lot of revenue to make it any amount of profit uh, so like so I, I think it was Dorsey you might have said that like Square which is undeniably by any measure by any sane measure a smaller business than Salesforce mm. would pay more revenue would pay, pay more in this tax than Salesforce would right and that's why I think that, that that's what would cause somebody working in that in, in that sector to pipe up a bit yeah yeah uh, but then I suppose with the nature of Twitter and the nature of how we like to play uh, issues out and we all love a good row and a good debate mm -hmm. um, uh, Mark Benioff and Salesforce has kind of called out Dorsey mm -hmm. to a lesser yeah. extent Stripe I think he focused more on Dorsey um, you know it, it's it's kind of irresistible as, as unfortunately as a news thing I see Connor Murphy uh, waving at us there <laughs> yeah, live um, we'll have our own Irish proxy I'm sure at some stage um, do you think I don't no I don't know I yeah. mean I, I really don't I mean there is a problem with homelessness in Ireland in Dublin no question it is a different magnitude to that though in San Francisco as far as I can see it's a different level for it's sure. a different level entirely yeah, yeah, totally. I mean there are 10 yeah. cities I uh, think I also think the um, it's harder to draw a straight line uh, connection between tech and homelessness in Dublin yeah no absolutely because the big tech companies, but they don't dominate in, in the same way. Listen, thank you very much, Des, for, for joining us today uh, at the Web Summit, and the very best luck, and we'll talk to you soon. Cool, thank you very much, Ed. And that's all we have time for this week, folks. Don't forget that this episode was brought to you by PwC. Hit like, share, or tell somebody about this podcast if you like it. Otherwise, from me, Adrian Weckler, I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.